Hello there. Welcome back to the Meaningful People podcast. I think that's what it is. I think that's what this is. It's a podcast. I'm Nachi Gordon. And I'm uh, uh, and I'm Alexander Linger. Okay. It's good for all the stalkers out there to know <laughs> my son's name. And we have a really, really incredible episode. This week, we actually shot this many, many months ago. And Baruch Shem, we're a little ahead. Now, who do we have on? We sat down with the very well-known criminal defense attorney, Ben Brofman. We were just so happy that we're not getting sued. Yes. And we didn't get into any trouble. That's true. But we were sit down to, with him. Yeah. And, and give us time. I, mean, I don't know how much he charges in an hour, but I'm sure it's... More than, more than we gave him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I the joke, we didn't give him anything. W- when when you think of a lawyer, just in the world, I think he's one of the most famous lawyers in the, and definitely in America. And when you say Jewish and lawyer, he's the go-to person, like a from a from lawyer who is representing, you know, some very interesting characters, many high high profile cases and. There's so much to learn from this episode. Yes. Scenarios where he didn't compromise his Yiddishkeit, his, mm-hmm. his Shabbos observance, and s- stuff of those sorts. Um, so we were so happy to sit down with Ben Brofman and, and hear his story. Yeah, and I, I'll say it. I'll say it. I came from, I was working in Brooklyn, and yeah. and I set myself up. It was a 40-minute drive. I had an hour and a half, and I got there. I got to, to, to hear the studio. I got here. I think it was like two minutes late. It was it was the most uncomfortable two minutes of my life. Yeah, because you know his time is very precious, like to everyone. So uh, if Ben Braff is listening to this, I I'd like to apologize for coming late. But we had a great time. We had a great time, and it was a great episode. And uh, enjoy. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. We're here with uh, Mr. Ben Braffman. Nachin are used to saying Rabbi Brafman because we were both in Yeshiv for Oh, yes, we do. We're very fond of your brother, but we're going to talk about him. All right. But we want to talk about your, your background a, a little. You're a child of Holocaust survivors. That's right. They, did, they, were, they were not in the camps. They managed to get out the right after Kristallnacht. And uh, my mother's uh, parents and her one of her sisters and her husband and baby were murdered in Auschwitz. But um, both of my parents managed to get out after Kristallnacht, and uh, my father's parents came with him, and a Sefer Torah, which he uh, rescued from a burning shul in Vienna. Wow. And that Sefer Torah if is I, in Yeshiva Frakwe. Wow. Yep. Hmm. Was that always a thing growing up that you knew about that Sefer Torah, like to keep mm. that? No, I it? knew about it when I got older, and I was able to restore it, because until it was restored, it really couldn't be used. A lot of the letters had melted off from the fire. Mm. So, so growing up in in your home, did was that a topic of conversation often from your parents, or they didn't really? They didn't talk about it. My uh, mother didn't talk about it. I said at her levaya when I spoke that I think today after she died was the first day that she was no longer afraid. Hmm. Really, I think she lived in fear of uh, having her family taken away from her again. As as a yeah. child, did you see that fear? Yeah, it manifested in itself in everything she did. And I used to go down and take out the garbage. We lived in an apartment house. And by the time I got back upstairs, you know, all three locks on the door were locked. <laughs> really? I had to give her my uh, social security number to get back <laughs> in to the apartment. Did, oh. you, did you, like growing up, did you say, one day I'm going to be one of the most successful lawyers in America or in the world? Because of what happened to my parents, too. No, it wasn't. I, like I really a, didn't think I was going to be a lawyer. I had no interest in being a lawyer until I started to uh, decide what I wanted to do after getting out of uh, college. I went to Brooklyn College at night and I worked full time. And, you know, in those days, going to law school was something people did either because they wanted to be a lawyer or because they wanted uh, three more years to figure out what they wanted to be and what they wanted to do. So, so. You, so you were trying to figure out what you wanted to do. Yeah, so what I, was it about law that, I guess... It wasn't you? anything about law. There was something about criminal law that I liked and I understood, and I became uh, good at it. And when I graduated law school, I went to NYU for a Master's of Law and Criminal Justice, and I uh, became good at it, and I worked really hard. So criminal law spoke to you, though. What was it about criminal law? 
it involved people's lives, and the rest of uh, the law I had really no interest in, and it was about uh, money, and since I never had any money when I grew up, it didn't interest me, and I knew nothing about real estate because my parents never lived in a house, and criminal law was kind of interesting. I grew up in Crown Heights, so I was surrounded by either Lubavitch or uh, criminals, so yeah. uh, <laughs> it was in my blood one way or another. Where I, I'm always curious about this, and you could be you've spoken about this before, but I, I haven't heard it. Were you more of the black sheep in the family, or was your brother more? The My black My brother sheep? was never the black sheep. No, you know, I was. You know, I was. You know, projected uh, to be an Oswarf. Oh and, really? You know, oh really? Uh, <laughs> and I took a while not to become one. So, and okay, interesting. So, so at what point did you? see your career going a lot further than you initially anticipated? Um, Is there a moment? It wasn't a moment. There were a lot of uh, trials I had in the, uh, after I left the DA's office. I had, uh, I'd say, more trials than anybody else in New York between 1980 and the early 90s, and I was back-to-back on trial almost for... 11, 12 years in a row, and I started to win a lot of them, and people uh, began to take notice. And I think when you do good work and you work really hard, uh, you know, you earn uh, a lot of uh, respect. And I always practice with a lot of, I think, personal integrity. And, uh, you know, years ago when I needed to get off uh, Shabbos or Yantov, it was a big uh, deal. You know, I had to you know, argue and sometimes beg. And uh, now when I come into court and it's around, you know, October or September or April, a lot of the judges say, you know, Mr. Braffman, what are the days that you can't work? <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've come a long way. That's incredible. That's really, that's really just amazing to hear. Do you, do you think your yeshiva education contributed to your success as an attorney in any, in any way? Well, I think it taught me to argue. It taught me to see both sides of... Uh, an issue, is that, um, and that's from Gemara. Because people, do say that we say that all the time. If you learn Gemara, you can be a great lawyer. Is that true? Well, I I never really learned Gemara as a kid because mm-hmm. I just didn't enjoy it. I'm doing Dafyomi today, so I'm learning more in the last couple of years. Okay, than, give uh, give a shout out. Who are you doing Dafyomi with? Alone, alone. Mm-hmm. All Daf? Are you using an app or? I'm using Art Scroll. You know, they have okay. an English <laughs> old school. version of uh, Art Scroll, and you can teach yourself. And I do and. It's interesting, you know. I learn uh, not everything, but there is a couple of things from every uh, masechta that I remember and I enjoy. And you know, my son is a uh, rebbe in Eretz Yisrael, and he's manahel of a great cheder that's named after my brother. Um, but um, no, I'm teaching myself. You know, I had a a terrible uh, accident in mm-hmm. a year ago in April, and I didn't think I was going to survive and I did so you know my kids and wife taught me to say Baruch Hashem when I talk about it so I do but um, you know ironically if it was not for COVID um, I would be out of business because I fell at the beginning of the epidemic uh, pandemic and the courts were closed for three months and that's when I couldn't go to court anyway I don't so, know if you'd be out of, like, you would have just be no, on a break I, and then you'd come no, back. I think, no, I think my practice would have just, uh, you know, you can you can survive in my uh, business so long as you are able to do good work. And if you're not able to go to court and you're a trial lawyer, you know, people look for the next person on the list. So I don't know if I would have been out of business, but I pay a lot of salaries every week and I'm pretty much uh, earning uh, the money for the firm. So I think I... I would have probably closed the firm for a while, and who knows? I don't know. So, Bar- 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 Sham. Yeah, Bar- 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 Sham, Bar- right. everything worked out. Um, okay, so obviously this isn't live, and you, we could cut out anything that we can't talk about, but okay, first of all, the Puff Daddy story. I know I've heard it, and I'm sure Naki heard it, but I'm sure there's a lot of, we have a lot of young listeners who haven't heard the story. They certainly haven't heard it from you. Right. Would it's, you be able to say It happened 20 over? years ago, so you'll forgive me, because I'm certain if he heard it now, he would disavow it. Ever, <laughs> he would ever disavow it happening, because I don't know if he would remember. But, it, you know, when you go to work for someone like him, it's sort of, today I wouldn't be overwhelmed or awed 
But he's an interesting guy. People think he's just a rapper. Um, he's a brilliant uh, entrepreneur. And even then, I saw he was, you know, a marketing genius. And when you come into his life, and Johnny Cochran, uh, of blessed memory, um, brought me into his life. And, you know, I meet him, and, you know, Puffy says, you got to give me all your numbers. And I said, okay. And I said, I'll give you my office and my cell, and what do you want, my home number? Yeah, I'll give you my home number. So he said, yeah, I want all your numbers, and you got to be available 24-7, because that's the kind of person I am. I said, look, here's the deal. I observe the Sabbath, so you can't call me Friday night uh, or Saturday until sundown. But if it's an emergency... Um, I have people in my office who are not Jewish, and we have a system. So if you really have an emergency, you can call the office. There's a 24-hour service. Uh, Someone will answer the phone. You tell them who you are and that it's an emergency. Someone on my staff will call you back. And if it's really an emergency, they will fax me what happened, and I will look at it. And, you know, if I think it warrants me calling you back, I'll call you back. I'm not crazy, you know, but I'd like to avoid you calling me if it's avoidable. He looked at me and he said, now, you got to be available 24-7. I said, yeah, 24-6. You know, (laughs) odds are you're not going to have an emergency Friday night, okay? (laughs) I'll pray that you don't. So the first Friday night, uh, my phone rings at home, and, you know, it's a blocked number. Um, I suspected it was him, but I didn't know. I checked the fax machine. Nothing came in. And it rang at least 200 times. Not in a row, it rang 20 really? times, and they hung up, and then they rang another 20 times. And, you know, I knew where my parents were, I knew where my uh, in-laws were, and I knew it wasn't a family emergency. Um, and I didn't answer the phone. So after, you know, Shabbos was over, I called him and I said, were you trying to reach me Friday night? And he said, yeah, I was. I said, what happened? He said, nothing. I said, was this a test? So he said, yeah, it was a test. He says, well, I'm sorry I didn't answer the phone. He says, don't be sorry, man. I won $10,000 because I bet you wouldn't answer the phone. I said, you got to be kidding. (laughs) So that was my first test. I mean, that's that must be extremely tempting. Was it like Abram Avinu? Did he give you 10 tests or he just stopped? No, he didn't give me any money. (laughs) Um, Okay, so this is a question that Nahi knows what I'm referencing here. In Yeshiva Farakwa, we always heard a story that Puff Daddy wanted to donate a gym, and no, that's not true. It's not true. And everyone okay. said, "My Brahman said no. Wow. He wants his name. It's, it's not true. No, it's not true. Didn't okay. happen. Never, False. Never wow. occurred to him, and it never occurred to me to ask him, <laughs> because unless I was United Negro College Fund, he wasn't interested. So. Right. That okay. Makes sense. That's a. So everyone, anyone who's been to YFR who knows that story, it's just not true. It's not true. It's just a lie. It's not, you, a, it's which, not a lie. It just was just never there happened. true. Which kid do you think came up I with that? Know. Somebody made it up. My brother asked me, is it true? And I said, no. <laughs> All right, Robin, you heard about it? Well, no. He you know, was curious as to how that rumor got started. Let's talk about something else, all right? Yeah, sure. So I want to talk about Ry Brofman because right. he had definitely, for me, a profound impact on my life. And I'm sure Naki and a lot of people went to Shifa Rockaway. And something that I know that he loved to talk about, and I think it's connected to what you do, is he always liked talking about the matzah, the situation, where the world is. I think he's the first person that introduced to me that like the world could be a very crazy place, and like we have a Tyra, and we have something to connect ourselves to. And it's, it's interesting, because you kind of see how crazy the world could be. Is there like a connection there? Well, you know, he always, uh, I think he was intrigued by uh, what I did in my career, and I think he was happy uh, for me, and I was happy for him. We were very close, even though, you know, we are, you know, obviously a little bit uh, different, but in many ways we were uh, the same, and I knew, you know, exactly uh, what he did um, and um, how he did it, and, you know, I often said that, You know, if you were going to ask me how many people, you know, do I know from uh, the yeshiva world, from the from community, who are really, you know, pure or 100% sadik, you know, my brother comes to mind and nobody else does. So, you know, I didn't see him ever having an agenda or a interest in learning or education. And he really cared about his Talmidim and he really cared about 
the yeshiva. And, you know, the yeshiva for Rockwell, when it first started, I mean, they were in a house on Virginia Street in Farakway, and it was really interesting to see the community. It wasn't the Farakway that you know today. And there were people in the community who were Jewish, who were very opposed uh, to that yeshiva. And, uh, you know, my father was, uh, you know, president of the yeshiva Farakway and trying his best to, you know, help where he could. But, uh, you know, eventually it became a question of... uh, um, finances and my brother Rabbi Pear, where they were, you know, insistent on this yeshiva going to have a uh, future, and and it obviously did. And you know, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me, you know, during shiva, after, you know, shiva, and you know, they stop me in the street. Um, you know, they recognize me and they say, I want to tell you a Rabbi Brafman story. And one after the other, one is better than the next. He saved my son. He helped us. You know, with the shidduch, he helped us, you know, and they love him. And it's really quite uh, remarkable. And, you know, um, so he and I got along and uh, he came to me with, um, he came to me with issues, not legal issues, but with uh, chesed issues. And I had, you know, some good judgment. And uh, I think part of the reason of uh, my success was because I, you know, I believed that the, you know, the responsibility that comes with success is to sharing the success with uh, people who are less fortunate. So I think it goes hand in hand with being successful, not losing, uh, not getting too carried away with your own uh, success. Because I think, you know, a lot of people ask me, what do I attribute my success to? And I say, uh, uh, rule one, you got to have mazel. Rule two, look at rule one. Yeah. So you know, I think that's uh, true, and I think other people who are brighter than I am, who haven't reached a level of success, I don't think they've worked as hard as I have over the last uh, uh, 40 years uh, since I've been in private practice. When I was in a DA's office, I worked harder than anybody in my bureau, uh, and when I started my own firm, I worked really hard to get it started, and then uh, I still work hard. Yeah, at the ripe age of 55, you're still going at it. Right, 72. Wow. (laughs) One of our favorite people, Shmuel Sackett from The Dream Raffle, not Dream Raffle, (laughs) The Dream Raffle. Dot com. Dot com, sounds even better. (laughs) And uh, you started... Like people are buying left and right. I know yeah. Naki. This like, promo code is taking just... out a lot of money to buy <laughs> right. something. His wife's like, "What are you doing?" I mortgaged my house. <laughs> so I... Well, you could get an apartment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's the dreamruffle dot com, and there's one prize, and that's a million dollar apartment in Yerushalayim overlooking Harabayat. So it's it's a luxury apartment. It's beautiful. It's about three blocks away from the new U.S. Embassy. Oh, wow. It's a great great prize, and all you have to do is put in the code M. PP, Meaningful People Podcast, and in addition to doubling your tickets, right, if you buy one, we'll give you two, five gets you 10, and so on, we'll also take $10 off. So it's a great, great thing. And this year, the money is primarily going to help Israeli farmers that are keeping Shemitah. Mm. In addition to other things out, we also help teens at risk. We help the canine unit that is involved in search and rescue, finding missing Jews. Fantastic, fantastic. All the all the uh, um, funds go to Tzedakah. There's nobody on salary. There's nobody on commission. This is what the money goes for. And it's, again, thedreamraffle.com. Put in code MP. And it's, I, ama- it's amazing. People got to just think about investing in Mashiach. If you really believe Mashiach is coming anytime, you want a place overlooking the Harabayas, good real estate, buy a ticket. And even if you you don't have as much Amun and Betachan as that, you still get an apartment in Israel in a gorgeous location. So whether you're a Ruchniistic person right. or Gashmius. Well, like I said, you could also take the cash alternative. Right. The guy who won last year, if you're Mayor, really. <laughs> right, no. Mayor, Mayor Reichman from West yeah. Orange, New Jersey. Good for For him. personal reasons, he took the cash alternative, and that's fine. It's 100% available uh, as that option, and whatever's good for you. $500,000. That's correct. $500,000. Nah, which one would you do if you could? Nah, is going for the apartment. There's yeah. no I question. think so. I, I think, think so. I'd also go for the apartment. Like that's that, that's something that you just can't turn down. Overlooking the higher bias, like isn't that a great decision you'll have to make? You yeah. know what I love about this type of stuff is because like obviously you could I mean you speak to the local rav, but you could use your miser. And it's the type of thing that like I probably I'm not like debating should I buy an apartment in Israel or not. Like this is the the once in a lifetime opportunity. Exactly. And a lot of you know a lot of a lot of people who I knew that bought bought tickets. A lot of families said like 
this is my chance of getting a place in Israel. This raffle. This I remember I was it. watching the drawing live. Right. And, <laughs> and Mayor right. Reichman, I'm sorry, Mayor, I hated you for like 15 seconds. But then you were. He, he, he <laughs> but then I, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but like, I was like, oh, are you kidding me? But good for him. Yeah. And um, I hope I win. I'm, I'm this not is the fourth year. Say. This is yeah. the fourth I, year of the raffle. I hope everyone like, forgives me if I win. I yeah, it will look a little staged if you win. I'm sorry, but yeah. chances are, I mean, there's so many people listening. Please, people, everyone, buy a ticket, and I want you to say, yeah, I bought. I listened to meaningful people, and I won. Just use promo code MPP. Head to thedreamraffle.com, and maybe you'll win. Matzlacha, I'm Yisrael Chai. And now back to the episode. As a as a, a high as someone who represents high profile, um, I guess called clients, is your job to ever believe them? Do you have to really look them in the eye and believe that they didn't commit the crime, that they're innocent, or is your job to not, it's not relevant. Your job is to defend, you know, their side of the story. Well, it isn't their side of the story. I mean, the way our system works is the government must prove someone's uh, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And so long as you, you know, it's rare that people get picked out of the yellow pages for the right. indignity of being prosecuted. That sometimes they're overcharged, and sometimes they didn't mean uh, what happened. And more often than not, uh, you know, very many people have a misunderstanding of the nature of my practice. You know, because mm-hmm. there are occasional high-profile cases, and I've had more than my share. But you know, I would say eighty percent of my practice. Um, if people come to me early enough is to keep people from being prosecuted. I mean, my greatest successes are not the ones anybody read, reads about. It's the people who are very prominent in their own life, but I've kept them from being prosecuted. And, you know, I go to their weddings of their kids and they, you know, they pull me into the middle and they cry on my shoulder. It's kind of the nature of my practice. Sometimes you get... Uh, um, you can win, sometimes you can lose, and you never have to decide whether you believe someone or not. And I never really ask people, are you really guilty? So I, I generally know because I've seen the evidence. And as I said before, you know, very few people are ultimately prosecuted who are not you know, really guilty of something that they've done, may not be guilty of what they're charged with, there's, you know, it's a it's a hard uh, profession. It's a hard profession. A lot of pressure in my job. How do you how do you deal with that pressure? I, I mean, anyone who knows you knows that you've been in some of the most high pressure cases and in that the courtroom. The world's watching. Everyone's watching yeah. to see like what happens. And how do you how do you deal with that pressure going in, leading up, in the middle? Well, I've always maintained a little bit of. Uh, balance in my life. I have a very uh, good family, uh, Baruch Hashem, and I, uh, you know, I have always maintained a good sense of humor, although, you know, there are some cases I've been in where there's nothing funny about it, right. um, and uh, I don't take myself too seriously, but I take my job very seriously. I know someone else's life is riding on my uh, my shoulders, so, you know, I, st- I say to people, I started in this uh, profession I was six one and you know I get worn away every uh, year just a couple of inches so you know now I'm five six so now, you're, uh, now you're modeling for under right, five ten under five ten yeah which is a local clothing store in, in the five towns right and you I think it's, it's close to your to heart get that job no it must not, it must not be they do some great marketing with you right it, it's an interesting dynamic because I feel like it could people could see your job and what you do as like Oh, okay, he's doing that, but then when someone actually needs you, right, you're you're like a malach potentially for right. them. So it's it's really an interesting observation, and I'll tell you a great story, uh, which is a true story. I was at a, uh, I call it a cocktail reception, and uh, my wife and I were standing there, and I really just wanted to leave, and I see someone walking towards me. That you know how you could tell sometimes you don't want to have a conversation. <laughs> with this person, but he's coming and he has a whole you know, entourage with him and he comes up to me and he says, I've always wanted to ask you a question. I said, what is it? He says, well, we don't know each other, but I introduces himself and he says, I don't understand how you could live with yourself representing people who you know uh, to be guilty. And I said, I'll tell you something. I don't really wanna have that conversation <laughs> to, today, so I'm gonna leave. I hope you don't think I'm rude. 
But we left, and my wife says to me in the car, she says, boy, that was rude. I said, I know, but there are some times when you really don't want to have that conversation, and especially with someone who is just, whatever I say is not going to make them happy. So fast forward two years, my phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning. And when it rings that early, you know, that early in the morning or that late at night, <laughs> it's never good. You know, people aren't calling you to tell you they just got engaged. Or it's puff daddy a, testing a you baby. again. <laughs> no, it's not. It's years after. It's 25 years after, 20 years after his case. Uh, okay. So it's, and I pick up the phone and I said, hello. And he says, you know, uh, Mr. Braffman, I don't know if you remember me. And he told me his name. And I said, I do remember you. Why are you calling me? He said, well, I have a son who's, you know, um, in medical school, and he was just arrested in upstate New York, and he had uh, grass and a little bit of cocaine in his car, and if this doesn't get dismissed, his career as a doctor is going to be ruined, and he is a brilliant guy, and I need you to help him. And I thought about saying, you know, ever since I met you, I convinced myself that from now I'm only going to represent innocent people. <laughs> um, but, but I didn't say it. And I said, just give me his name and where he was arrested and we'll figure something out. Just relax. So I called one of my guys and they went up there and he got him out that night, set bail. Make a very long story short, it was an illegal search. They did a pretext stop on his car um, the drugs were thrown out. The case was dismissed. It was sealed. And today he is a, um, a, pediatric, neuro, a, a pediatric oncologist. Oh, That's wow. what they're calling him. Wow. And he saved kids all over the world. And he is such a brilliant doctor that they really fly him to these real rare cases. And he figures out how to save a lot of kids. And he started to call me every time he saved one of these kids. And he says... Ben, you get an assist. <laughs> and then he stopped calling, and I've lost track of him. But, you know, to be honest with you, do I have nachas from that case? Yes. But um, that person, you know, was ready to, you know, beat me up because I was representing. And, in, you know, unless it's someone you care about or you love or it's you, people see it differently. So that's that story has a, a happy ending. But that's a conversation that I just refuse to have because the people who ask you that question you're never going to convince them and unless and until they need you you're never going to need them they're never going to need you so do i have a lot of people in the five towns who are critical of the work i do absolutely and many of them ultimately become my clients and many of them you're right i'm a i'm a malach to them when it happens so not many. There aren't that many people, thank God, in the Jewish community uh, who need me. And, you know, the, the mistake people make um, is we have the biggest yentas of any uh, community, but we also have do more chesed than any other community. And, you know, I don't know what your relationship is with Vasas Nayas, but I think that, you know, that uh, organization, I think, lives for Lashon Hara. And if it wasn't for Lush and Hara, you know, they would have nothing to talk about. So um, I think that there's a misconception, which is partly the result of intellectual dishonesty of the mainstream media. So if a from person gets in trouble, it's, you know, a front page story. And people who see it think to themselves, oh, my God, look at this. An Orthodox, you know, rabbi or an Orthodox Jew is having... Uh, fraud charges filed you know maybe there are 25 30 people who have that happen to them out of you know millions so the percentage is very small but one is uh, too many and it's a small part of my uh, practice you know i'm sort of the go-to guy in the community but i'd prefer not to have those cases for many many reasons so. i take it that you're not a fan of lush and hara you don't I'm not at my 70th birthday party they actually, my wife gave out wristbands that said, be like Ben, uh, don't talk Lush and Hara. <laughs> and I have this you know, game I play with some of my grandchildren where on Yom Kippur I say to them, you know, I'm going to ask you to look at all of the al -chaits. And you know, I'm going to give you a pass on any of the ones related to sex because you're too young to be worried about. But I want you to look at all of the ones that deal with rechilis or gossip or Lush and Hara or and I want you to really honestly tell me that last year 
I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And for everyone, you can honestly tell me you didn't do, I'm gonna give you $100. And I never spend a lot of money because you know it, this, is a, this is an Avera that a lot of Talmidei Chachamim don't get right. And you know, I just learned a couple of uh, weeks ago that the uh, second best medrash was you know, destroyed because of three Averas. One was you know, uh, immorality, one was idolatry, and one was uh, Lashon Hara. And I said, wow, that's a pretty high up there in the, in the whole scheme of things. That's a pretty big Avera. And you know, I think if we didn't gossip, if we didn't you know, look to enjoy other people's tragedies, I think it would be a much better world in many ways. So I imagine, you know, that's that's really commendable. I imagine you can go to shul on Shabbos and sit there and people want to sit next to you and sort of... Nobody sits uh, next to me except my grandchildren. Is that is that on purpose? Is that something that... Well, it's, is, they've learned over years. A, I don't want to talk to people about my work. And two, they don't want to be seen, you know, talking to me because people, <laughs> people will think that they've got a problem. So I was going to ask you, I'm sure people come over to you all the time and they try to ask you about... You right, know, they certain, do, when, especially and, you, when it's in the newspaper. And you don't have any tolerance for that? No, I say to them, if you were in trouble, would you like me to tell every ent and shul about your legal issues or would you want me to maintain uh, confidence? And they, you know, walk away embarrassed. What do so. you say that... I think you're you specifically under you, a unique situation that you're, you know giving your parents background and your mother's background and now kind of seeing the world unfortunately opening up toward to anti-semitism again i think it's like just recently they said like in 2019 it raised 14 percent or some statistic like that what what do you say about that it's terrible and i don't think it's ever uh going to get better and i think a lot of it has to do with uh uh you know the way the, way the media uh, treats uh eretz yisrael and i've spoken about you know uh, Israel a lot and you know Israel is the only country in the world where after they're attacked and they strike back the first words of most administrations as uh, let's not have a disproportionate response let's calm down let's uh, you know end this without uh, you know um, without uh, so many uh, bodies and you know I've I've spoken about this publicly uh, a lot I was the keynote speaker at a conference in uh, Yerushalayim three years ago, four years ago, where it was the Lawfare Project by Shurit Hadin. And the real, it's a really good organization. They do a lot of litigation on behalf of uh, uh, you know, victims of terrorist, terrorism, and they do a lot of uh, good stuff. And I spoke to 600 lawyers, and I said, this is a pretty interesting group and I think you'll be receptive to you know what I have to say on this issue but you know Israel is the only uh, country in the world that is ever criticized for defending itself Israel is the only um, country in the world who has you know great army and great uh, medicine and great uh, um, intellectual uh, property and great computer scientists and yet they're criticized you know all the time and it's the only country in the world when there is a war, the sign of who's the good guy and who's the bad guy is body count. You know, when you have a war and Israel, you know, has a great military and Israel is, um, you know, suffering only 15 casualties and there are 300 Palestinians who are dead, you know, they use those numbers to essentially uh, show that Israel's the bad guy. And I, I often say, you know, when we were in World War II, when we bombed Dresden, there were hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties. And, you know, we weren't criticized as being war criminals. You know, we were right. The Nazis were bad. We looked to end the war, and you can't do that when you're using force. No one said to the United States, you should have, you know, withheld your strength and treated them, you know. It's just not the way wars are conducted. And, you know, I once cross-examined in an exercise at a law school, I, I cross-examined uh, somebody who was uh, purporting to take the position of a, a Hamas general. And I said, so let me ask you a question. When your soldiers or your martyrs or your, your military people shoot rockets into Sterot, 
You have no idea where those rockets are going to land, do you? No. Are you hoping that they will land in a school or a daycare center or a hospital? Yes. Are you targeting civilian, you know, uh, targets? Yes. And you're hoping to kill as many Jews as you possibly can. Is that right? Yes. And when Israel pinpoint targets a UN facility that is used to store rockets and bombs, um, you criticize us because it's a UN facility. How the hell did those uh, rockets and bombs get into a UN facility in the first place? And you know, it's a, you don't have to be Ben Brathman to do that cross-examination. I mean, it's obvious and it's over in a couple of minutes and there are no answers to those uh, questions. So I, I think it's just a hypocritical world. I think um, if nothing else, I think we have uh, made it worse in recent uh, in recent years, and it's it's going to take a long time for it to get better. If I don't know if it'll ever get better in my lifetime, that's a scary thought. Yeah, well, that's very it's, scary. It's the fact, though. You know, look mm-hmm. at what's in the newspaper every day. It's true. It's true. The world's spinning out of control. It, I I look at your job probably like the ultimate. You need to be Don Lakoff's chus, like really. I do not like. So what, what advice would you give everyone? Because we're all judgmental in certain it's, ways. It's a big, big uh, you know, advice, I guess, in relationships and in our dealings with people. I imagine that's where you're going. Yeah, yeah but we all jump to conclusions. You know, so what's the way not to do that? What's, is there, I is think it, you take a deep breath and you wait and you say, well, if that were my son, would I be so eager to criticize? If that were my father or mother or an uncle or aunt, if it was my family, would I want to, you know, everyone else in the community to write them off before any of the facts come out. And, you know, my brother used to talk to me about it all the time. It's one of the, it's one of the best midos that a person could have. You know, like you really need to not, you know, be ready to write somebody off, especially in the Jewish community. Someone asked me once, what are the, what are the best attributes of the Jewish community? I says, what they are, what they should be. What they should be is, you know, no Lashon Hara, no... Uh, it shouldn't be that they immediately criticize. And to be honest with you, because I'm a criminal lawyer and because I'm, you know, often in the newspapers, I people, even good people, even people who sit and learn, come up to you and they pass a remark where they don't know what the hell they're talking about, but they pass a comment or remark which suggests to other people that they do. And I am, you know, reluctant to call them out or be publicly, you know, critical um, because I don't want to get into an argument that's really doesn't make anything better. We'll be right back to that episode. And we're clearly talking to Ben Brofman, who's dealing with the law. Now he's like, where's he going with this? The law. He, he deals with law. He deals with law. Law. Something he doesn't deal with is pharmaceuticals. Maybe he does. I don't know. Maybe he represents someone who. But I'll tell you what's the similarity between Ben Brofman and AMR Pharmacy. Okay. I can't you wait get, to hear this. You get the best. You Ooh. get the best. If you want, chas shalom, if you have, I hope you never need Ben Brofman, but if you do, you could say, this guy is the one that Hashem is putting me in the best scenario to get represented, and chas shalom, if you need some pharmaceuticals, it's chas shalom, you know? Maybe you don't want you to get You said chas shalom so many times in the last two minutes. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the chas shalom organization is also sponsoring. That, yes, so. but this this is obviously sponsored by AMR Pharmacy, the best pharmacy in the world, and that is the the, the same the similarity. I feel like I'm drunk. There's a similarity between Ben Brofman and AMR. Is that they're the best at what they do. So give them a call, 848-222-1110. We hope you never have to call Ben. But let's be real, we all need AMR in our life. Enjoy the rest of this episode. If you could sit down with someone from history who's no longer alive, who would that be? And speak to them for an hour. Who would it be? Well, I, you know, it's, an, it's a hard question to answer because there's so many uh, good choices, you know. And uh, you're talking about recent history. You're talking about, you know, from the beginning of uh, the Torah. You know, if I were... Uh, I could give, you, you could give two answers, one that's recent and one that's, you know, I guess from the beginning of time. Well, recent, I think I'd like to sit down again with my brother and talk to him about my experience with Dafyomi. One of the things that bothers me uh, to no end is the fact that for his whole life, he tried to get me to uh, learn with him, and I just never did. And, you know, to be honest with you, I always thought I was too busy, and now I'm as busy, and I find I make the time. So I'd like to, 
you know, I think he's sitting up there and next to Hashem, and he's saying, I, I told you <laughs> that this was eventually going to happen. I could hear him saying that. Right. I, I, could, I could hear his, his voice. voice. Like, yeah. I, I told you. Give him, a, give him a break. I think that's uh, one of the reasons I survived this, you know, uh, you know, traumatic fall where I was, you know, laying unconscious in my, you know, in my marble floor with my head split open and blood pouring out and you know, Hatsala basically, you know, they saved my life, but they also, you know, on the webs on the radio you could hear the concern in their voice that, you know, they didn't think I, some of them didn't think I was gonna make it. And that's where Vasasnaya is who monitors there and the next day it was in the post that I had a, you know, terrible oh, uh, fall and, you know, thank God I knew the reporter and, you know, when I, you know, regained consciousness, she kept leaving me voicemails and I finally was able to call back and I said, I'm alive, I'm okay, I'm going to be fine. And I was in a hospital where I was in the ICU, but everyone around me was a COVID patient. So they made like a shower curtain section for me. I mean, a, 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 a ICU within an ICU, but all around me, people were coding and I could hear them. They were dying left That's and right. So and I'm saying to myself, I survived this traumatic brain injury and I'm going to get COVID. And not make it out of the hospital. So it was very, very uh, frightening. And my wife couldn't get in and none of, nobody could get in. So, you know, I was there really alone. And, you know, David, my son, managed to uh, get to the United States on a hot solar plane. You know, he has a friend mm-hmm. who is uh, involved in hot solar. Ellie Rowe? Ro. What? Ellie Rowe. Ellie Rowe, yeah, yeah. I had a feeling it was Ellie Rowe. They, they got him I, on a hot solar plane. I imagine you have a, a lot of a car to hot solar. Yeah, I give them a lot of money. <laughs> and I think nice. they, and they use uh, it well. <laughs> I think they do great stuff. And even before I, I needed them, I used to see you know, what they did. And I, you know, I spoke at a Hatsala function, and I um, was a big fan. And I still am a, you know, a very big fan, especially especially now. I feel like you've spoken at every type of function. I did. I've <laughs> I've, I've I've done over a hundred. Oh dinners in the last uh, five years and uh, uh, master ceremonies or keynote speaker um, and it's you know one Israel fund and friends of Israel defense forces and Israel cancer research and Yeshiva Farakaway and I did Chevron and I did uh, I don't know I, there are too many to even you know this remember. is why you don't get nervous anymore you, what? this is why you don't get nervous anymore. I don't get nervous anymore For not at this I get <laughs> nervous sometimes when I'm in the court before you know a judge who's you know not a fan of my client and it's you know hard sometimes to level the playing field that's one of the things that bothers me a lot is i see young prosecutors who for the most part do a very good job and you know are like me they did a good job they did their best they but there are a couple who are zealots who feel like they're doing you know god's work and that they must you know win at all costs and you know some of them uh, don't realize that there's life after the government and it's not a good idea to alienate a person like me. <laughs> no, t- because, because, because when they, you know, decide they want to be a federal judge, you know, and they call everybody you've ever dealt with. And, you know, I, I'm not shy about this stuff. You know, right. I mostly give very, very uh, good praise. But sometimes I say, I don't think the person has the temperament to be a good judge. And why do you say that? Because... They didn't have the temperament to be a prosecutor. So. Okay, so so recent history, you, you choose your brother, and if right. I guess not recent history, who who do you want to sit down? Well, with? you know, you know, it's such a hard question. I'd like to sit I, down. I'm sure, there's an I'd, incredible answer. Well, I'd like to sit down and talk to Menachem Begin because I think you know he personally had a lot to do with you know making Garrett Israel into uh, a state. Golda Meir would be a choice. You know, Meisher Rabbeinu, I'd like to. What would, you, what would you speak to Moshe Rabbeinu about? I, be, I said you needed a much better lawyer when they, <laughs> when they told you you couldn't come to Eretz Yisrael. I mean, you know, it's just not fair. And, you know, I read something interesting by this uh, uh, young, I knew his father, but this young uh, uh, Rebbe whose uh, his name is, last name is Rosner. I don't remember. Sean, uh, Sean yeah. Rosner? He lives yeah. in Israel now? Yeah. Okay. He has this great book. Somebody gave it to me as, as a gift. And in the flyleaf, I haven't read the book yet, but it's a, a book on the on the Parsha, you know. He, but in the flyleaf, he says something very interesting. He says, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu uh, was told that he couldn't go to Eretz Yisrael, and yet he did a lot of stuff that you would think was preparation for going. And when, you know, someone said, you know, <coughs> why was he doing that? I think the answer is you should learn from that, that you could start a mitzvah, 
doesn't mean you have to finish the mitzvah, but you get credit for starting the mitzvah. And it's like when you want to learn daf uh, yomi, you could be overwhelmed by the prospect of studying for the last seven years. I was at Siam Shas last year in January. Uh, my son flew in from Eretz Yisrael with a couple of his grandchildren. My son-in-law came with some of uh, his grandchildren. We bought, I don't know, 10, 12 tickets. And I'll tell you, I was overwhelmed, and yet I felt embarrassed that I almost felt like I didn't belong there, that I could buy a ticket, and I was happy to see all of my grandchildren. And, and you know, we had really great seats, and then, you know, my grandson, you know, Shlomo Brafman, when they started to dance on the on the stadium floor, he got me onto the floor, and I, I danced with a lot of the Cheshav or Rabbanim there, and it was cool. But, you know, I didn't want them to ask me, you know, <laughs> Did you do this? And, you know, I would have said, no, I'm, I'd like to, but I don't know if I can. So I started um, after that, and I did brachas, and I started Shabbos, and then I fell. And, you know, for three months, I like to say I fell behind, <laughs> but I had a good excuse. And then I thought that was it. I wasn't going to, you know, pick it up again. But I gave up on Erevin. You know, Erevin is way above my pay grade, you know, <laughs> Now, even with the coloring book, I couldn't figure out <laughs> what they were talking about. So I, I skipped Ervin, and you know, my son said to me, "Just do what you can. Don't be a starker, and don't think you have to." So I waited, and then I, you know, I, I learned Psachim, and now I'm doing uh, Yuma, and um, I'm finding some of it really interesting. And a couple of weeks ago, I did a seum on uh, Psachim. The last part of Psachim is a pidgin aben, the last, the last paragraph deals with a question that you ask at a pigeon aben. And one of my brother's, you know, son-in-laws, they had a baby, his daughter had a baby. They were gonna make a pigeon aben, and I said, I got a great, I wanna do a seam. And I did a seam. And uh, you know, last week at my, uh, at my home, which was the one year anniversary um, of my, uh, thank God it wasn't my art site, but it was an anniversary of my fall. Suicide. They made a suicide da, and I did a, I did a, uh, a seum on uh, what comes after, not Psachim, what comes after uh, Psachim. And it's not Yoma. Uh, Nachi? Not Erevin. Not Erevin, it's Yoma. before. All right, well, I did another seum. So, and now I'm going to Eretz Yisrael um, if they let me in. And the, the cheder is going to make a dinner in my honor. It's going to be a uh, Sudas Hadar for the cheder. And, it's amazing. Uh, it really, it sounds like you, you, you feel like you have a, a second lease on life. I after. do. I do. Would you say, we ask people what their favorite mitzvah is, but would you say dafyomi or learning Gemara? Is what, it? my favorite mitzvah now? Yeah. Yeah, it's still davening every morning. Davening. Yeah. yeah. That's your go-to. Yeah. Why, why, why davening? Because, you know, it's part of, I feel a connection with all of the, from people who, wherever they are, they put on a talus and fill in the morning. And even if it takes you, you know, eight minutes to daven as opposed to somebody who takes an hour, I'm doing what I can. But, you know, I, you know, I put on talus and, and fill in, and it's, uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great feeling, even though I'm rushing in like a meshuggah in the morning. But, yeah, so I don't know if that dafyomi is ever going to be my favorite uh, Mitzvah. I think if I, you know, I manage to find a chavrus, it might be easier for me to enjoy it more. But um, no, we'll see. Uh, as someone who's seen some of the, I guess, most complex, interesting cases, court cases in the world, I guess if we could look at, you know, this world as, as a court case and and us trying to, I guess, bring Mashiach and, and get to that to that level, I guess as an attorney, what what would you say that we need to do? To get to get to that level, to be I think, redeemed. I think it's not what I think you have to do. I think you know, I think the goal is going to come when uh, there's no more um, lashon hara and there's no more sinas You know, I mean, I think we have a lot to learn, and I also think you know, sometimes I speak about you know chil Hashem and uh, and you know kiddush Hashem, and sometimes it's a question of just being a mensch. And, you know, when you're wearing a yarmulke, you know, in the street and you're acting like a wild, you know, hilaria, um, you know, people don't see a young kid who's, they see a young Jewish kid. Mm. You know, I, I sometimes, when I go to speak somewhere, you know, I don't wear a yarmulke at work and I don't wear a yarmulke in court, but if I go speak somewhere, you know, and I, 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 I put on the yarmulke 
as I'm about to speak. And I, I, I use it as a demonstrative, you know, example. I said, you know, if, if I put on, if I don't put on this yarmulke, I'm Ben Braffman, I'm criminal defense lawyer. As soon as I put on this yarmulke, I'm Jew lawyer. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, uh, um, it makes a statement. And I want the statement to be something that, uh, you know, speaks well for our people. Because I'm not just, you know, it's not just speaking for myself. You know, you have a whole... Uh, Army, and it's not like you know you're a black guy, so you have black skin, so you speak for the whole black community. If I don't put on a yarmulke, you don't recognize me as a Jew, and if I put on a yarmulke, you recognize me as a as a Jew. So it's interesting. I we know you need to go, but I have I think one more question. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Last question is like this: you you are I'm just gonna be very straight up. You are world famous. You are literally one of the biggest lawyers in the world and you're still living like a from life and you're very connected and you're not you're, like you're, you're actually doing it right. how how do you like not get to and you're a humble person how do you not get too cocky about it well i think i think it takes a lot of discipline and you know i can stand up in front of a, a bank of 50 microphones and not be overwhelmed by it not be nervous comes with practice, comes with experience, it comes with, uh, you know, understanding what role you're playing. You know, when I represented uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, it made the publicity that we got on the Puff Daddy case seem like he wasn't even an important guy. Because mm-hmm. Dominic Strauss-Kahn was the president of the International Monetary Fund, and then he had this episode in the hotel, and the morning of my involvement in the case, a lawyer from Washington flew in he brought me in as the local guy and I picked him up at the airport and we drove into Manhattan Uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn was um, being held at the special victims unit which was at the time on 125th street and it was pouring and you know we got to the block and the block was closed and I saw maybe 500 members of the press in the pouring rain standing outside and I remember saying to the lawyer I was with somebody very famous must have gotten arrested last night he looked at me and he says it's our client it's Dominic Strauss Kahn are you kidding and I said oh my god and then I met him and you know I met him and you know he was a interesting guy it was like hanging out with Henry Kissinger of world economics and this guy was brilliant and he really had his finger on the pulse and he was in a lot of trouble. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, this is going to put me on the map if I wasn't already on the map. But shortly thereafter, I went to Eretz Yisrael. And then there was an article in, uh, I forgot the name of the magazine. I have a, a part of it actually in Lucite in my, in my house. But there's a picture of me and it says, Advocat shall Dominic Strauss Kahn, who Yehudi, who Dati, who Gaon. And I said to myself, boy, this is really cool. <laughs> I'm a Jew, I'm religious, and I'm a Gaon. And I said, I, two out of three I can agree with. But, you know, and I showed it to my brother, and, you know, he thought it was great. And, you know, I showed it, you know, I wish my father was alive to see it. But it, I realized, boy, you know, you could really screw this up, and they'll blame you. They're not going to blame him. They're going to blame you. So there was a lot of pressure, but the case was dismissed. And, you know, I was told that if I went to France, because he was going to be president of France, and I would get a ticket tape parade. I was like, you know, Neil Armstrong when he came home from—so from, that, that month after the dismissal, we were in Eretz Yisrael, my wife and I— and we went to a, a simcha at a Svardi shul. And I walked in and we sat down because we were eating, uh, you know, Shab Friday night meals there. And people kept sending over bottles of wine. <laughs> and I kept saying, what is this for? And they were all French Jews. And they all came over and they were carrying me around the <laughs> room. It was like really, it was really like... Were you bar mitzvah? Cool. <laughs> I was bar mitzvah, you know, but it was like pretty cool. So if you're asking me, you know, that was a little bit of a heady experience, but you can't, you know, you can't start to believe your own 
you know, I was going to say something, which you then bleep <laughs> out. But, you know, I, I, you know, you can't start to let it get into your head because at the end of the day, you're a high-profile lawyer primarily because you represented, you know, high-profile uh, uh, people. And yet, you know, sometimes because you're representing somebody who nobody has heard of because it's you, suddenly it's a high-profile you know, case. And sometimes it's not good for the client and sometimes it's, it's good for the client. But I, I've learned that, uh, I've learned that I've been consistent throughout my, uh, career and I've been consistent with, uh, trying to be, uh, a Shoma Shabbos and I'll never forget my brother, you know, cut me a little slack because I was in a case with 10 co-defendants. It was over except the jury was deliberating. The case was in New Jersey. It was a brutal snowstorm. And Friday afternoon, the judge made the decision that um, she was going to sit on Shabbos. Now, I could not at that point try and persuade her to give me off. She would say, don't come here, but we're going to continue. I had a client who needed me. And so I called my brother, and he said, look, you could go. Here's what you do. First of all, stay in a hotel close to the courthouse so you could walk. Second, get food from somewhere where you don't have to eat treif. Third, when you're in court, don't speak into the microphone. Don't write with the pen to take notes. But you could be there because it'll be a bigger chalal Hashem if you take off and insist on taking off under the circumstances. And I learned a lot of respect for him in, in that conversation, because if you you know if you ask some sakma chassid, he would say chas v'sholem, you should be in court on the shabbos. But that was uh, what I admired about my brother. It was a lot of practical wisdom he had, where you know he got it. So if a kid came to yeshiva and and really didn't want to learn, he would talk to him, and he would you know he would have a schmooze with him instead of you know learning. And you know that schmooze would do more for that kid. Than if he forced them to sit in the shear. So um, I give him a lot of credit. Ben so. Brofman, thank you so much for coming here and, and, and lending some of, of your time to us. I really hope we don't get billed for this because I just don't <laughs> think we can afford it. But you know what? You won't get billed. And I'm talking to two uh, graduates of the Yeshiva Farakwe who are, you know, doing well. And uh, you both uh, look like you're not shaving on Sphere. So <laughs> I'm. I'm I'm happy oh, it doesn't look natural? That. No, it doesn't look <laughs> natural. <laughs> well, all right. Thank you so pleasure. much. My pleasure. Nice to meet you all. Wasn't that something? That was a real doozy. What was what was the most insightful thing that he said? Well, given the fact that we recorded this episode like five months ago, I have no idea. I, it may have been six months ago even. It was a long time ago. Um, so we're I, sitting here. And so like when in the beginning, at least when we like we started doing this, I was always very excited to re-listen to it. Mm-hmm. At this point, it's very hard to do that. But... This episode has been so long ago that I, I think I'm going to be able to listen and be like, oh, like just an actual listener to it. So I'm very excited to listen to this episode. Hi, Myself. future Yako. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree with you. Um, it's people ask us all the time, like, uh, oh, so who are you having on next? And without fail, every single time. I, I am like I have no idea. Can we say what just happened before when we we're like loading them yeah. up? <laughs> like we we literally we we did Baruch Hashem, we did three episodes in the past uh, week or two, and we we were like oh who was the last person we did? We literally could not remember. And and I'm not gonna say who it was. It was someone. He's gonna his episode can come out in a few months. And no, very much sooner. You're not kind of good time, I think. Okay, so so you'll see it, you'll figure out who it is, and it's like a very it's it's a big deal to have this person on, and we couldn't remember it. It's just. We're like sitting there. Who was it? So I don't. I don't know what it is. It's like Hashem makes, I guess, woman forget childbirth and us forget our podcast. I think that's a medrash somewhere. Where it okay, says well, that. add this to that medrash. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for listening. Rate us five stars. Check out other episodes or people you maybe not have heard of, uh, may have not have heard of, and um, and I want. I, I said this in the beginning, but I, I actually really want to come up with a catchphrase. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought we, we kind of like turned that on the use, on the listeners and no one really came yeah up no one, one really helped shout us. out to Shimmy Schiller for trying yes great yeah thank you Shimmy so I'm gonna I, it's gonna be something along these lines because I think it's a common theme that I'm seeing like and, and I'll, I'll try to finesse it so we'll try to figure it out One second, but, and, and thank you to what's his name for helping us get, get, get Ben Brofman on the episode no yes 
Oh my gosh, imagine I would have forgotten. Yeah. Baruch, thank you. Baruch uh, Shol, thank you so much for helping. I, I definitely want to give him a shout out. Um, and also, before you say the cash phrase, I also want to say, you heard the Dream Raffle ad. So please go get a ticket and look at our show notes, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening. You could get a nice big percentage off your tickets. And have a catchphrase that you've been thinking Yeah, the about. catchphrase. Okay, the catchphrase is... So so check out the Dream Raffle. The catchphrase is, everyone can be meaningful. Do you like that? We'll figure it out. But it's a long, It's that idea. It's that idea. Like, so sometimes people are like... That just no, happened. I really think we could have everyone on this podcast. I really could. It just some episodes wouldn't be as interesting. And we try to go towards, you know, people that maybe there's a better story or maybe chances of I think people, I think people get surprised and like they enjoy, the, I guess, the more, le- the less well-known people like, like say, Noiki Roberts. That episode has been so popular yeah. lately. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't know who he was before. So... You never know. Yeah. You might be next. Bye. (laughs) Ciao. There you go. Bye.